how does a leader in a company that has great success find themselves, you know, a leader looks up one day and they don't have a story. Uh, they're stalling because they failed to provide purpose. What's happening here? Uh, and as you take us into this, start with, I love the order that you've given to us. What's the warning sign? And then what actually happens if you fail to see the warning sign? Yeah, so, so too many leaders can, in my experience, in all different kinds of organizations, not just companies, but nonprofits, government agencies, and others, if, if they feel like they've got the mission, vision, and values posted in the break room, that everybody understands what they're all about. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, Simon Sinek says, start with why, and we think that's great. But we add on an additional question about purpose, which is, start with, what are we about here? I once heard a leader ask that in a question saying, I'm not sure what that's, that's what we're about here. And I thought, wow, that captures a lot. That captures identity, mission, vision, strategy, culture, values. All of these things are kind of wrapped up in what are we about here? And what happens is as organizations grow and change, uh, the leader has to constantly reemphasize and retool and restructure the narrative that captures purpose, identity, culture, and values for the enterprise. Not only because new people are generally being added, but because things have shifted. And uh, so, for instance, we tell the story in there of, of, of a young CEO who runs a software development company who's walking through a trade show with his best customer. This is the, the customer who totally gets his firm, even though they're adding on all kinds of new things, and they meet a potential new customer. And his current new customer says, let me tell your story. I know you guys cold. So, tells the story. And to the horror of the CEO who founded this company, gets it completely wrong. And uh, so then he realized that if my best customer can't tell others what we're about, I must be doing something wrong. People aren't able to easily repeat the narrative of our purpose, our place in the marketplace, what we do different and what we're about. And so we have a lot of tools in there to help leaders do that. And the principal warning sign is when you're not around and people start making decisions, uh, they do things that you just can't figure out. And you track them down later and say, why did you go left instead of right last night when I wasn't around? And if they don't have an answer that's consistent with the way you've defined purpose for them, it's probably your fault as a leader. You didn't give them enough purpose so that the purpose you gave them could be the boss when the boss isn't around. Yeah. I want you to speak to something we've heard Pat Lencioni say on this program. And, it, and it's basically that it takes seven times minimum for a leader to say something before it really, really sticks with people. These are sharp. Oh, gosh, at yeah, least. Yeah, at least. <laughs> That's what he's saying. It's like, it's like a minimum there. And we're talking about intelligent men and women. It takes that much yeah. time. And, and I'm just, I'm teeing you up to talk about this because you're taking it a step further. At each level of change in the organization, you're saying the leader has constantly got to be re-hitting that drum and as the purpose slightly changes, you got to keep rehitting it. It's like you can't hit it enough, correct? You got we, and you got to reframe it too. First of all, we're big on repetition, but it's got to be creative repetition, right? Because you know, as Patrick Lencioni others have pointed out, uh, transmission is not reception, right? And uh, we actually have in there as a joke a rule of one hundred from an experience of mine when I had done a big acquisition and had a my dozenth meeting with uh with the new acquisition still couldn't get them to understand how we fit together and i was very frustrated and one of my people said well you only got 88 more times to go <laughs> um so we called that the rule of 100 um but being creative having rich rather than lean communications and ultimately trying to pack into a very simple narrative all these pieces that capture mission vision values strategy distinctive advantage place in the market culture uh, if you can get those things wrapped into a tight, compact statement, a narrative of a story like the great storytellers have always done for their groups over the course of time, then you can do it. And we often say to test it, go to your kitchen table, do the kitchen table test. If you can't explain to your mom or your spouse what you're enterprising about in 35 words or less, employees are not going to understand. It. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's so good. All right. Moving on. Uh, we'll go two in a row here, and then we'll skip around some. But Leader of Team Zero is the title of Chapter 3, Stalling When You Let Your Team Splinter. Boy, this is this chapter, this really addresses something that's so key. And, and this, this takes down many a great company, doesn't it? It really does. And there's been so much good work done on teams. My friend Stan McChrystal, you know, who, who I served with and, and uh, in the government and the Army, gave us a great blurb for the book. as has this magnificent book, Team of Teams. 
But, but the real take we have on it, which is building on the work of others, is looking at all-star teams and senior management teams and including, you know, when I was running a public company, I hired in these amazing, accomplished people who all terrific executives in their own right. And I figured, well, these, these people make so much money. They're so good at what they do. They have resumes that are so um, uh, awe-inspiring. They'll self-manage, right? I mean, they don't need me. Uh, I don't need to babysit them. They're grown-ups. Um, and what we found in our experience, in our research, it's exactly the opposite. All-star teams need the leader to be even more engaged and constantly being with the team and having them act as a team instead of just a, a loosely coordinated working group whose results kind of blend together at the end. So the real difference there is, you know, a working group is more like a track and field team where all the events are individual, but the scores add up to a team result versus a basketball team where every movement of every player on the court all constantly changes the game every second. And so to get senior teams, senior executive teams, to truly think that they're working together as a team rather than simply being responsible for other parts of the organization and coming together to coordinate their results, uh, turns out to be one of the hardest challenges of all. What are the warning signs that we leaders need to be looking for to, to avoid the splintering? Well, one of the ones I always like, and you know, now I'm a, I'm a chairman of several companies and serve on the boards of a number of companies. And, uh, and if I'm a comp committee chair, or even if I'm not, sometimes I'll say to the team, I'll say, I'll say, how much of this year's uh, results and the bonus plan are we willing to toss into a common pool so that everybody is dependent on everybody else's results? And uh, sometimes you get some really interesting answers back. Yeah. Some will say, oh, I'm all about the team. But gosh, you know, I don't want to be penalized when a bill screws it up. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's a really good warning sign. If people are willing to uh, put part of their reward and incentive system into a true collective codependent system or, or if they just want to be judged on their own accord. And so that's, you know, one of six or seven warning signs we put in there about when you need to, need to take a look at your team. Right. So what is the leader now that we know what it looks like and how it manifests and we see you gave us a warning sign. How does the leader make sure that he or she is adjusting to change to make sure that the splintering doesn't happen? Yeah, well, we have a great tool in there we call the team charter. And we lay out in there a system for leaders to do. We often do it with teams at offsites. And uh, the team charter is a document, a founding document for the team about what they're about, why they're there, how they operate together, how they communicate, how they solve conflict with each other. A lot of people don't have, a lot of teams don't have an improved and advanced method of solving conflict. So they, so they default to snotty emails at eight at night, Yes, um, which tends not to solve a lot of problems. <laughs> it just winds everybody up, right? So you predetermine how you solve conflict. You'll even predetermine and everybody will agree to the rhythm by which we analyze how we're doing as a team, reflect and, and go into an improvement cycle. So if you can, we have a format there for what we call the team charter. If you can get a team away at an offsite a couple of times a year and either construct or reaffirm that, then a lot of the other stuff tends to fall into place. Once you can get senior teams to actually believe they're a team, that they're all operating by the same rules, and a lot of the other issues tend to sort itself out. We do an exercise. I just did it with a company recently uh, when, we, when we run off sites. And we'll say, hey, just the very first day, let's introduce each other. Tell me what you do. Tell me your name, what you do, and tell me who's on your team. And inevitably, as you go around the room with executives, they'll say their name and what they do. And when they say who's on their team, they talk about the people that work for them, mm. the people that aren't in the room. And almost nobody says, the people in this room, my peers are my team. So you often just have a kind of psychological block in the minds of senior executives that their peers are their team rather mm. than the people that just work for them. 